Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God, back with you with the next video in my series, Reading Dracula by Bram Stoker. Without further ado, returning to Dracula, as read by Lord Naren White. They were more than kind and courteous, and took us at once on board the, the Tsarina Catherine, which lay at anchor out in the river harbor. There we saw the captain, Donaldson by name, who told us of his voyage. He said that in all his life he had never had so favorable a run. Man, he said, but it made us afeard, for we expected that we should have to pay for it with some rare piece of ill luck, so as to keep up with the average, to keep up the average. It's no canny to run fray London to the Black Sea with a wind a hint ye, as though the Dell himself were blawling on your sail for his ain purpose. And eh, and at the time we could no spare a thing. Gin, we were nigh a ship, or a port, or a headlet. A fog fell on us and travelled with us, till I, when after it had lifted and we looked out, the devil could see. Could we? A, the devil, a, a devil, a thing could we see. We ran by Gibraltar without being able to signal. And then we came to the Dardanelles, and had to wait to get our permit to pass. We never hear, we never, never were within hail art. At first I inclined to slack off the hail and beat about it till the fog was lifted. But whilst I thought the devil, the devil was minded to get us into the Black Sea. He was like to do uh, it whether it would uh, w we would or no. If we had a quick voyage, it would be. No to our miscredit with the owners, or to hurt to our traffic. As the old man who had served his ain purpose would be grateful, would be dece decently grateful to us for no hindering him. This mixture of simplicity and cunning of superstition and commercial reasoning aroused Van Helsing, who said, My friend, that devil is much more clever than he is thought by some, and he know when he meet his match. The skipper was not displeased with the compliment, and went on. When we got past the Bosphorus, the men began to grumble. Some of them, the Romanians, came and asked me to heave overboard a big box which had been put on board by a queer-looking old man just before we had started Frey London. I had seen them spear at the fellow and put on their twa fingers when they saw him to guard them against the evil eye. Man, but the superstition of foreigners is perfectly ridiculous. I sent them aboot their business pretty quick, but as but as just after a fog closed in on us, I felt a wee bit as they didn't and ain't something. Though I won't I wouldn't say it was again the big box. Well, on we went, and as the fog didn't let up for five days, I juice let the wind carry for, carry us. For if the Dale wanted to get somewhere, well, he would fetch it up a reet. And if he didn't, well, we'd keep a sharp lookout anyhow. Sure, enough, we had a fair way in deep water all the time, and two days ago when the morning sun came through the fog, we found ourselves just in the river opposite Galatz. The Romanians were wild and wanted me right or wrong to take out the box and fling it in the river. I had to argue with them about it with a handspike, and when the last of them rose off the deck with his head in his hand. I had convinced them that, evil eye or no evil eye, the, prop the property and the trust of my owners were better in my hands than in the river Danube. They had, mind ye, taken the box on the deck ready to fling on, and it was marked Galatz via Varna. I thought I'd let it die till we discharged in the port and get rid of it altogether. We didn't do much clearing that day, and had to remain the night at anchor, but in the morning, bra and airily, an hour before sunup, a man came aboard with an order written to him from Green England to receive a box marked for one Count Dracula. Sure enough, the matter was one ready to his hand. He had his papers a read, and glad I was to be rid of the damn thing, for I was beginning to massle to feel <laughs> I was beginning myself to feel uneasy at it. If the Dale did have any luggage aboard the ship, I'm thinking it was nay neither than that same. What was the name of the man who took it? asked Dr. Van Helsing with restrained eagerness. I'll be telling you quick, he answered, and stepping down to his cabin produced a receipt signed, Emmanuel Hildesheim. Bergenstrasse 16 was the address. We found out this way 
was all the captain knew, so with thanks we came away. We found Hildesheim in his office, a Hebrew of rather the Adolfi theater type, with, his, with a nose like a sheep and a fez. His arguments were pointed with specie, we doing the punctuation, and with a little bargaining he told us what he knew. This turned out to be simple but important. He had received a letter from Mr. Deville of London telling him to receive, if possible, before sunrise as to avoid customs, a, a box which would give, arrive at Galatz in the Tsarina Catherine. This he was to give in charge to a certain Petrov Skinsky, who dealt with the Slovaks who traded down the river to the port. He had been paid for his work by an English banknote, which had been duly cashed for gold at the Danube International Bank. When Skinsky had come to him, he had taken, the, taken him to the ship and handed over the box so as to save porterage. This was all he knew. We then sought for Skinsky, but were unable to find him. One of his neighbors, who did not seem to bear him any affection, said that he had gone away two days before. No one knew whither. This was corroborated by his landlord, who had received by messenger the key of the house together with the rent due in English money. This had been between ten and eleven o'clock last night. We were at a standstill again. Whilst we were talking, one came running and breathlessly gasped out the body of Skinsky, had been found inside the wall of the churchyard of St. Peter, and that the throat had been torn open as if by some wild animal. Those we had been speaking with ran off to see the horror, the woman crying out, This is the word of a Slovak! We hurried away, lest we should have been in some way drawn into the affair, and so detained. As we came home, we could arrive at no definite conclusion. We were all convinced that the box was on its way, by water, to somewhere else. But where that might be, we would have to discover. But w with heavy hearts, we came home to the hotel, to Mina. When we met together, the first thing was to consult as to taking Mina again into our conference. Things are getting desperate, and it is at least a chance, though a hazardous one. As a preliminary step, I was released from my promise to her. Mina Harker's Journal 30 October evening They were so tired and worn out and dispirited that there was nothing to be done till they had some rest. So I asked them all to lie down for half an hour whilst I should enter everything up to the moment. I feel so grateful to the man who invented the Traveler's Typewriter and to Mr. Morris for getting this one for me. I should have felt quite astray doing the work if I had to write with a pen. It is all done. Poor dear Jonathan, what he must have suffered, what he must be suffering now. He lies on the sofa hardly seeming to breathe, and his whole body appears in collapse. His brows are knit, and he is th maybe he, uh, his face is drawn with pain. Poor fellow, maybe he is thinking, and I can see his face all wrinkled up with the concentration of his thoughts. Oh. If I could only help at all, I shall do what I can. I have asked Dr. Van Helsing, and he has got me all the papers that I have not yet seen. Whilst they are resting, I shall go over all carefully, and perhaps I may arrive at some conclusion. I shall try to follow the professor's example and think without prejudice on the facts before me. I do believe that God's providence I have made a discovery. I shall get the maps and look over them. I am more than ever sure that I am right. My new conclusion is ready, so I shall get our party together and read it. They can judge it. It is well to be accurate, and every minute is precious. Mina Harker's Memorandum Entered in her journal Ground of inquiry Count Dracula's problem is to get back to his own place. He must be brought back home by someone. This is evident, for had he power to move himself as he wished he could go either as a man or wolf or bat or in some other way, he evidently fears discovery or interference in the state of helplessness in which he must, confined as he is between dawn and sunset in his wooden box. We will go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching. 
and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.